Welcome to the Transcendent Minds podcast, the podcast where we explore the mysteries of the mind and the human experience. Join us as we delve into topics such as consciousness, spirituality, and personal growth with expert guests and thought-provoking discussions. Get ready to expand your mind and discover new insights on this journey of self-discovery. Now here's your host, Peter Michael Deeds. Today, we have a truly remarkable guest joining us. Our guest today is Christian Jordanoff, a certified functional diagnostic nutrition practitioner and the author of the book, Autism Wellbeing Plan, How to Get Your Child Healthy. This book serves as a comprehensive resource for parents, shedding light on the most common health issues that autistic children face and providing valuable guidance on how to address them. But Christian's expertise doesn't stop there. His extensive health research spans various areas from autism and children's health to pregnancy preparation and recovery, as well as optimizing health and longevity. He's not just a theorist, he's a practitioner who utilizes advanced lab testing to uncover hidden metabolic and health imbalances in his clients. Christian empowers his clients with the knowledge and tools they need to take charge of their health. And he delves into areas such as diet, supplementation, detoxification, stress reduction, sleep optimization, and more to help individuals address chronic health issues and transform their well-being. And what sets Christian apart is his diverse range of certifications. He's a certified Buteco breathing instructor, PN1 nutrition coach, a grow baby practitioner, a DNA fit trainer and hold certifications in personal training, fitness instruction, and sports and event massage therapy. His wealth of knowledge and experience makes him a true authority in the field of health and wellness. And in addition to his written work and clinical practice, Christian hosts not one but two podcasts, Connecting Minds and Children's Health Podcasts. These podcasts serve as platforms for sharing valuable insights and engaging discussions on health-related topics. So if you're ready to dive deep into the world of health, nutrition, and well-being, you're in for a treat. Christian is here to share his wisdom and expertise, and I'm excited to explore his journey and insights on today's episode. Christian, welcome to the Transcendent Minds podcast. Peter, thank you so much. I hope I can live up to that uh, amazing introduction. You're making me blush here. (laughs) You're most welcome. I think it's important to characterize the essence of who you are and what you're bringing to the platform and the message you want to amplify. And I think that's very important. Now, I've gone through the book. And as I said earlier, I think one of the book's greatest strengths for me is its accessibility. Before we go into that, I want to dive into some specifics in your journey of becoming a health practitioner. Can you share with our audience a bit about your background and your journey? to becoming a health practitioner, and what motivated you to pursue this path? Generally in my life, I've been blessed with good health. Unfortunately, in my late-ish teens, I fell in with the wrong crowd, you could say, poor influences, and that led me down a path of very poor choices in my 20s. So I took my health for granted for more than a decade. And I guess when I turned 30, I started to realize this body is not forever. And I will not be able to bounce back from my my stupid decisions as well as I did in the past. I remember maybe I was 24, 25, I broke my leg really badly, both the tibia and the fibula, doing parkour drunk. Like that's the kind of stuff I was getting up to. I wish I had a mentor, an uncle, a cousin, a big bro to help guide me in those early years. In my 30s, I started to realize I've made a lot of poor decisions, but I had to find out, did I now screw myself up for life? Or was there a way to reverse some of these and continue to experience generally good health and li- live well and not, most importantly, not succumb to the diseases and the dysfunction that I saw around me with the older folks, like my grandparents and so on. Even my parents were starting to, quote unquote, deteriorate. So I started digging into genetics and the microbiome and neurotransmitters. And it was really seeing my grandmother, my mother's health problems. That kind of spurred me deeper into the journey. And then around 2018, 
is when one of the boys in my family, extended family, was suspected of being on the spectrum. And with the base I had gained up to that point, I had started to realize most of conditions and diseases and all the stuff, including psychiatric things affecting the mind, are pretty much the genetic stuff is all a scapegoat. It's basically until we figure out the mechanisms, it's all genetic and idiopathic. But I was more and more finding out it's lifestyle, it's diet, it's nutritional status, toxic exposure, stuff like that. I immediately started diving into the autism stuff. Luckily, at the time, I was reading a book that had a chapter on autism by Dr. William Walsh. So I started digging in the, into that chapter, then started following the references. And then I very quickly, through my desire to help the family with this child, I very quickly found out that most parents are not told the information that a lot of these kids have nutrient imbalances, deficiencies, toxicity, inability to detoxify toxins coming in through just standard diet, lifestyle. We are all exposed to these toxins. Just these kids seem to have diminished detoxification abilities, a lot of gut dysfunction. So I, I quickly found out that most parents aren't made aware of this information. And I joined some Facebook groups. I started sharing information, was met with a lot of disdain. Generally, people didn't want to hear it. So I said, okay, nobody will take me seriously until I write a book. When I actually started writing the book, I spent eight months pretty much every single day, 10 to 14 hours at the computer. And in eight months, I researched, wrote, edited, and published the book, pretty much all the work I did myself, except some of the graphics and the cover, the book cover. So that was published in 2020 in March. And yeah, since then, I sold a few hundred copies, helped quite a few families with my consulting work, with my courses. Obviously, with the book, I've done some pro bono work with some families in India, in Africa, and I just love helping people including those that can't afford the help. I, I still try to help them out as much as possible. There is no better joy to help a parent help their kid because a lot of these parents, they want to help their kids. They'll do anything, but they just don't have the tools. And I'm here to give them the tools. Beautiful. Love that story. Was there a pivotal moment or an experience in your life that shaped your decision to specialize in functional diagnostic nutrition? The functional diagnostic nutrition course, it, it, it came on my, my radar. I heard the founder talk on a podcast I was listening to. And at the time, I, the course was a little bit pricey for my pocket. So I was doing other things, but I kept coming back to it because I saw they were all about teaching you how to use lab testing. And I, I was like so fascinated. I was doing lots of blood work on myself and getting into biohacking and all this cool stuff. So I was like, oh, wow, we get to do stool tests and hormone tests. And I was a little bit mystified or rather it was a little bit mysterious to me because it was such a new paradigm. I always thought I don't have a formal education in, in medicine. How am I going to understand this stuff? But it literally is. You just start digging in and it starts to slowly make sense. Like any other skill, you put the time in, read some studies, read some books, talk to some practitioners that are doing it, run some lab work on yourself, then some friends. Eventually, people will want to work with you and stuff suddenly makes sense. And what I've also noticed is the longer I do things, the simpler things become, which I don't know, you've probably noticed that you, in, kind of in your work is the better we get at what we do, the more simple our methodology becomes for whatever reason. Yeah, I believe practice makes permanent. It doesn't make perfect, but it makes permanent. The more you practice it, and as long as there's a consistency to it, then you get a permanence going on because it affects your neurology. You can cultivate new neurons or better neuronal ability. So that's an excellent thing to do. And I totally agree with you. I think it's in anything that you want to do, whether you want to run a podcast or build a business or write a book or uh, learn a martial art, it's practice. It's not an academic thing. And it's great to have the, ac the academia and to have an academic pursuit, but you, you also have to humanize it into application on a daily basis. That's why they're, they're called health practitioners. We have lab tests, but you can't just take a lab test and then just treat the results. If not that I treat anything, but let's say a doctor. A good doctor won't take the results and treat the results. They will factor in the, the health history, the current circumstances, stress levels. Yes, the lab work 
but then you're not trying to nudge a, a marker up and down. That marker is there for a reason. So it's like a symptom. So if you're just trying to man manipulate markers up and down, it's in a sense still playing whack-a-mole with symptoms. What we want to do is address the, the, the needs of the person to restore health or give the optimal environment for health to emerge or re-emerge. And that takes practice because sometimes what works for one person won't work for the next one because we're so different in such different ages and stages. So we, we are practicing and you get better at it, but you still have to think on your feet. Many years ago, in another lifetime, I worked with a chiropractor and someone came in with a particular condition and he never treated that condition, whether it was a pain in their knee or a migraine, it, but he actually worked the whole body and he found certain aspects of a body were out of balance. There was an asymmetry to it. The question always is that people try to apply a symmetrical application to an asymmetrical symptom, whereas you've got to work out, as you were saying, you can't nudge the marker up and down. You've got to get some kind of symmetry going. So when you apply symmetry, there's a compatibility of alignment, which can promote healing and restore that body's environment. Sure. It's like when you look at the cholesterol, like this whole cholesterol thing is so ridiculous. You get your blood work done. Let's say your cholesterol is 236. Now you're labeled as high cholesterol. So they give you a statin to block the synthesis of cholesterol. But first of all, 236 is not very high for cholesterol. Second of all, let's say your cholesterol was indeed high, like 270. Okay, that's a little bit high. But what is that actually indicating? It's actually indicating that your thyroid is not working too well. So you're not utilizing that cholesterol. So if you improve the metabolic rate, if you improve thyroid function, it's like you're stepping on the accelerator pedal and the cells are going to utilize more of that cholesterol to create steroid hormones, which can be protective, anabolic. But how do you raise the, the thyroid? Do you just now take thyroid medication? That's again, treating, you, you put the cart before the horse. There's other ways where we can improve the thyroid function more naturally. L look at the liver, decongest the liver, improve liver function, improve gut function, add nutrition. So a lot of things like the amino acid L-tyrosine, selenium is needed, iodine from kelp. So add the nutrients. When you give the nutrients to the body and remove some impediments, see if it starts to do that on its own. If your child can't read or count, you count for the child. It's, oh, you're trying to do two plus two. You don't can't figure it out. It's four. There you, you're sorted. Move on to the next problem in the book. That child is not going to really have the best outcomes if we keep giving the answer. It's going through the process. So it's not just giving that thyroid hormone or reducing the cholesterol level. It's creating the conditions in the body where the cholesterol can be used. The thyroid is naturally being produced and uptaken by the cells. And then they're doing their jobs. The body produces cholesterol naturally anyways. And there's another conversation about statins and cholesterol and big pharma and marketing and big bucks that we won't go down that rabbit hole. Um, <laughs> but you're right. The chiropractor I worked with, when a client presented, he would always draw blood because the blood is like a tape recorder of all of your workings. And then he would analyze that. He would analyze the markers in there and then he would bring them back because you would have a much, much better picture of what's going on. And then, as you say, you cultivate an environment where healing can occur. I want to move on to the role of certifications, because you hold an impressive array of, cert of certifications in various health-related fields. Can you tell us how these certifications have contributed to your growth as a practitioner and author? The most pivotal thing for me was the functional diagnostic nutrition thing. From there, it's almost like you learn to learn or you learn what you should learn. Obviously, for the book, I had to read a lot of studies and compile a lot of research. But for me, now the, the certifications, I just do them because I enjoy them. I don't feel like I need to prove anything anymore. The book proves that I'm, I'm not completely full of crap, right? <laughs> <laughs> at least when it comes to autism. But I think if you can put out a book in the health space on any topic, whether it's pregnancy or autism or hypothyroidism, I think it shows that you have a little bit of knowledge. And at this point, 
I believe the way forward is to continue to do research, to continue to gather clinical practice. And I will continue to do certifications, but again, not because I need to show that I am trustworthy as a practitioner, but grow my knowledge. But I believe nowadays you don't even need certification. I know guys that I follow, that I consider experts, that have a completely different background. They have an IT background, but they have read tens of thousands of studies. They, they post on forums with ten, tens of thousands of posts. And there is one guy, he even does his own animal studies. He synthesizes his own supplements. He works with chemists that synthesize chemicals that he tells them to do. And he has no formal education. So I believe you can really tell if somebody is in it for the right purposes and they, they know what they're talking about. Because a lot of the time I've also noticed we can hide behind credentials, right? You can't question your doctor because they're the one with the ND. And not to diverge from the topic too much, but I took a wife, wanted us to take our child to the doctor. She had some skin stuff going on. And I had to explain to a doctor that was probably 15 to 20 years older than me, if not a bit more. I had to explain to him what an IgG food sensitivity test was, why I wanted it, and what we would do with the result when we got it. Because he was even like, okay, so we, he found it on the computer, finally. Okay, if, oh yeah, we do have this test and we have these markers here. Okay, but the, okay, I can do it, I can order it. But what are you going to do with it after you get the result? So I had to explain to this man. And I also gave him some website links to labs in the USA that run specific tests. I was telling him about the types of IgG antibodies that certain labs test for organic acids and how they can be used in the functional paradigm. At the end of the day, the mind inside here or whatever the mind is housed in the universe, it's whatever is here and the intent that's in, in here in the heart is really what matters. Doctors are overwhelmed. They're overwhelmed due to a lack of resources, but also I think there's an educational component that is missing especially when you're talking about things that you're talking about, because I know that short story is I was diagnosed with type two diabetes in, oh, 2018. Mm. What they said to me, it's your diet. But they said, you don't have a diabetic body. I wasn't like overweight or yeah. anything like that. But what they didn't realize was that it was actually attributed to stress. Oh yeah. Because my mom died and three months later, my brother got killed oh, yeah. in a road accident. And then a few months later, they diagnosed me with type 2 diabetes. They gave me this eat guide and I can't remember. I think a lot of Whole grains. Just, yeah. Rim, it's saturated full of fat. Uh, yeah, lots and of I went, seed oils. Yeah. So I did a lot of research into it and I created my own program. I even went to one of these diabetes gatherings where you have a trainer. And I felt like the odd one out. So I looked mm. around at all these bodies all these souls sitting in chairs, and most of them were overweight. And she said to me, what was your initial reaction when you heard that you had diabetes? I said, initially, I was a bit taken aback. But then I realized it was a gift. And she said, what? And people are looking at me like I've just come out of the world crazy. Why I said that was because it set me on a path whereby within six months, I reversed it. And my GP at the time said to me, how did you do that? I said, to be very honest with you by not following your advice. And so I told him what I did. And he said, would you like to give a talk? Because I was an exercise referral practitioner. He said, would you like to give a talk to our patients about it? He was quite forward thinking. And he wasn't taken aback by the fact I said, not following your advice. Probably he was initially, <laughs> but I had to take responsibility for my own health and well-being. I had to do the research and find out because what they were giving me was bog standard. Even looking at things like BMI, yeah. which I think is a total misnomer because I said to them, do you have an athletic BMI? Because I was training a lot. So I had more muscle mass than fat, but because I weighed more, yeah. I was termed clinically obese. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very, it, it's so limited in that sense. So limited. So I think your certifications, and I'm right with you on that. I have a commitment to lifelong learning, and I like aligning to that learning and practicing. And I think your certifications have enhanced your ability to offer comprehensive guidance to your clients and your readers. Peter, just before we move on, can I, I just want to go back to talk about this diabetes stuff. So when those things happened to you, what was probably happening is your cortisol levels were through the roof. And when cortisol goes up, other stress hormones go up. So adrenaline. 
So cortisol starts to break down lean tissue, muscle tissue, organs, even the brain, skin, bone. And it starts to increase uh, glucose production through the liver through gluconeogenesis. But because uh, the adrenaline also goes up in tandem, the stress hormones tend to rise and fall together. And adrenaline or norepinephrine for the American audience, adrenaline stimulates lipolysis. So the breaking down of fatty stores. So when you increase lipolysis, you have a lot of circulating triglycerides. A lot of of free fatty acids are circulating in the blood. Now, it's been well known for a long time in human physiology is that the tissues can only burn either glucose or fat at any one time. It depends on the substrate availability. So if there's a lot of free fatty acids from the lipolysis, from the adrenaline, from the stress hormones, uh, a lot of that lipolysis will inhibit glucose oxidation that causes the blood glucose to go up. So they say you're diabetic. It's because you're a greedy, sugar-loving dude. No, stress can literally can cause diabetes. Fasting can cause diabetes. Uh, keto, intermittent fasting coupled with heavy exercise, these things can cause your blood work, quote unquote, to look like you have diabetes. With a person like that, it's not dietary changes won't necessarily help. We have to help them address the stress, which in your case was like, I'm sure you were eating well this whole time, but the stress can undo what's more powerful, what we eat or our hormones. Any day of the week, our hormonal milieu of adrenal stress, sex hormones, they dictate how nutrients get burned, partitioned, and so on and so forth. And, you know, the, a lot of these diabetic people out there, it's not necessarily that they're eating poorly. It's the psychological stress or physical biochemical stress that is causing this. I think a lot of doctors are just working with very old paradigms. In fact, I, just yesterday, I recorded an episode for my podcast and I briefly mentioned it was about something else. It was about seed oils. But I briefly mentioned that I was looking at research where they're using honey as a sole treatment to treat diabetes. Many doctors will scoff at that. Are you crazy? Get out of my office. You're insane. But honey, and because sugar is glucose and fructose, taking a a bunch of carbs in in the form of honey or whatever, sucrose, it actually has a cortisol-lowering effect. There's mechanisms there that are a bit more complex than carbs bad for diabetes. It's so much more complex. I'm guessing you reverse that yourself by going through the grieving process doing more TLC, tender living care, getting through that stressful period and going back to some semblance of the baseline you were at before those traumatic events happened to you. That's a comprehensive explanation. Thank you for that. Meditation, Tai Chi, Aikido, a little bit of running. And initially I stripped out all the carbs. I was like, oh, okay, I got to strip out because that's all I knew. And I certainly don't put doctors on a pedestal. I value the fact they have their training and the discipline and all the rest of it, but I need to take responsibility and find out I'm just that kind of person. I'm curious. I want to research. I want to get a deeper penetration into what the hell is going on here. And you're right, that cortisol um, increase, which I believe strips away aspects of your hormones, it starts tagging all of those hormones and that creates this kind of chaotic environment in the system. And I found that I could eat what I wanted. I was in the gym. I was training hard. Sugar was not on my plate in any form because I don't have a sweet tooth. I ate very cleanly. When they said you don't have a typical diabetic body, what does that mean? That really caused me to set my feet upon the path of researching and saying, okay, I need to read the research. But all the research that I did read was all very similar about carbs, that kind of keyword of carbs. If we go, carbs, oh, they're bad. Carbs are bad. They're not bad. The right kind of carbs are really good for you. But I found within that six months, I went from, I was 150. My HbA1c was 150 in UK terms. And my blood sugar levels were 18. By the end of six months, I was 38 HbA1c. 
my blood sugar levels were 4.7. I was a living testament because it was a mindset for me and about discipline, but having the right kind of knowledge and understanding what is the root cause of this as distinct from looking at the symptoms, because symptom is telling you something needs to change. It's nature's way of saying, hey, something needs to change here. But I don't need to treat the symptom. I need to look at the cause. Yeah. And that's what I started to do. And then when I tracked it back, I, I thought, geez, I went through all that period with my mom and my brother. And I not brushed it off, but I just went, yeah, okay, I'll deal with it. You know, typical guy. Yes, you know, I was just going to say. Press yeah. the grief and yeah. just press on because that's what you're taught as a man. Mm-hmm. You step, know, step up. up. Yeah, yeah, stiff upper lip, step up and stand tall and don't yeah. let it mow you down and all that kind of BS. But when I tracked it back, I, the, the rising realization in me was, okay, this is something else. Eventually, I, I told my GP about that and he went, we wouldn't have looked at that. They give you a prescription for metformin and that prescription is almost a ceremonial declaration for you to leave. Next. Thank you. Yeah. Next. Because they don't have the time, unfortunately, because it's not them, it's the structure that needs to change. So we can facilitate a healing environment as distinct from this mechanistic approach to medicine and to health. But it takes time. Of course it takes time. You have time. to get to know the person, understand. Like I was talking with a client today and never mind the, the, the blood work, never mind the supplements and all that stuff. First, I'm like, how are you? Like. How is the, the the job stress? Because that was a big thing. And I kept telling her, we will never out supplement or out meditate the job stress. So then she told me she's changing jobs. So I'm like, great. All right. So we have something to look forward to. So we're covering a lot of the soft things, not necessarily let's look at the lab test. Let's see what supplements we should add, what supplements we should stop. And of course, that and the diet is super important. So I'm like, okay, we can tweak the supplements, but where's that liver? Where's that grass-fed organic liver? That's nature's multivitamin. We will never be able to add those minerals and those compounds that we don't even know exist that may actually be essential for health. We just don't know that what they are yet. Uh, we will never be able to outsmart nature. So that's a big focus. And a lot of doctors... They just don't have that time, like you rightly said. I'm sure many doctors care. I did a show on my podcast recently that doctors are one of the professions with the yeah. highest suicide rate. And GPs, I think psychiatrists, anesthesiologists, and I think general surgeons. I, I, those four that I think it, three of those are right. I, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm misquoting the general surgeons, but there's a reason why the suicide rate is so high. It, I'm sure job dissatisfaction is a huge part of it because if you're having people coming in day in, day out, week in, week out with ever worsening health problems and you can't even seem to help one, two in 10 people and you're just hoping these people just go away and never come back, you would rather have that. I'm sure there's a lot of job dissatisfaction that, that, that's tied in with that. A lot of repressed emotion, I would imagine, subconsciously because if you're someone who's in the trenches of care, and you really want to ensure your patients have a level of homeostasis in their physiology, and that doesn't happen because you don't have the time, it makes me wonder whether they're just either robotic yeah. and they're just dishing out scripts and hoping that will take care of the issue and repeat and repeat, or they go home and they put their head on the pillow and they look back at their day and think, I'm not able to help all those people because I don't have the time because the infrastructure doesn't facilitate that. So what does that do to their subconscious mind? What does that do to their emotional life? I'm not saying that's every doctor out yeah. there, but if, if the suicide rate is so high, there has to be a reason for it. Sure. Yeah, yeah. It must be so demoralizing and heartbreaking to spend whatever, eight years in doing one of the hardest to achieve degrees and then doing your residency. And look, a lot of it is traumatizing. The studying for these exams and doing 30, 40 hour shifts in night shifts. A lot of it is very demanding. And then to get all out of all of that, 
with a lot of student debt and potentially diminished health and whatever else, whatever other social opportunities left on the table, I'm sure it becomes very disheartening to then start dishing out toxic substances to people and either seeing no improvement or, or worsening. And it must be very difficult. And I have a lot of empathy for these folks that I can imagine that pretty much 99.9 out of 100 percent of them are coming in with the best of intentions. Like when you were a kid and like, I want to help the world. I want to be a doctor and help to heal people. I'm sure most of these kids going into med school are coming in that sort of wide-eyed and with these amazing, beautiful, grand intentions. And this sort of sick, perverted system grinds that out of them. So I'm sure a subset of them develop some type of mental derangement eventually, unfortunately. It wouldn't surprise me. It's like anything new, the novelty soon wears off. You have that gung-ho idea of, give me all your sick, give me your own bed, and I will heal them, (laughs) right? To uh, a point whereby the end of your day, you you feel you haven't really helped anybody, but you feel like you have helped people from the standpoint that you are a proponent and you're amplifying what the system tells you you can do. I, I even said to my, I even said to my GP at the time, I said, you know what you need in your surgery? You need a microbiome specialist in your surgery before they see you. So the system wouldn't allow that. I said, well, you have acupuncture now in the NHS. You have all these other different protocols that they've allowed. So why not something like that? Because we now know that there's a connection between gut health and brain health. If you look at the Heart Math Institute, there's a connection between heart and mind and looking at the coherence of those things. And that's yeah. what I found in that six month journey with meditation practice. And I don't mean sitting down contemplating my navel for 10 hours a day. It could be walking meditations, it could be just being present. Mm-hmm. So when I'm eating food, making sure I'm chewing that food and savoring those flavors. Mm-hmm. Because I used to just eat it for fuel, I'd get it in and go. So that's why I said it was a gift at the time. And so I think when we bring those practices in, they create an ecology that allows healing to occur. And not only that, you're highlighting doctors. I was speaking to somebody before I, you came on who was a matron, a nurse, and, and she has a degree in neuroscience. She started her own company because her whole thrust was to help nurses decompress because they're so overwhelmed, but she couldn't do it within the system that she trained so hard and for so many years to do it. So she created something external that she could amplify what she wanted to in terms of her whole thing is not mental health because the stigma is mental well-being, Mm. right? And she's now looking at reframing that because as soon as somebody hears mental health, they think, oh, are you depressed? You got anxiety or are you on a spectrum or whatever yeah. it is, but it's mental well-being. Mm-hmm. And that's the message she's putting out there. Actually, you should have her on your podcast. Yeah, I was thinking that already. Yeah, she's in Greece at the moment, but we had an hour's conversation on a meet and greet and nice. she's fascinating. She's in the UK, but she's fascinating what she's doing. But I think it'd be, she'd be a great guest for your podcast. That's and, awesome. uh, yeah, let's talk about your podcast for a minute, because I know you have two podcasts, so you Connecting yeah. Minds and Children's Health. Yeah. And that's allowed you to connect to the broader audience, explore health topics in more depth. How have your podcasts done that? What's been the feedback for you? Actually, the Children's Health Podcast used to be called a couple of different things related to autism. So I started that after I published my book to promote the information in the book. And a few months ago, I changed it to Children's Health Podcast because I realized a lot of the topics, all most families would benefit from the information with a few specifics. If your child has a specific health issue, like gut dysfunction and stuff like that. So that was that. And Connecting Minds, I started that in late-ish 2020. I was reading all these books. How it is, Peter. Yeah, I do <laughs> so, you, so you read all these books. You've done, you've started one podcast. You're like, I've done one podcast. I've improved the quality of the audio and I have the process down. So it's not too time consuming to get episodes out. Why don't I just start emailing some of these cool people that I'm either reading their books or I'm listening to them on other people's podcasts. I was big into podcasts 
for the last six years or so, maybe more. And I started emailing some people and the response at first was really good. I, in fact, before I, I had any episodes published, everyone that agreed, I would say, I would email the next person and say, look at this list of people that have already agreed to come onto my podcast. Check out, you could be one of these amazing people here. So I got some really awesome people to come on the show and I, I've covered so many topics, not just health, I've covered um, psychedelics and Buddhism and uh, the work of Stanislav Grof, um, uh, spirituality, geopolitics. I have some really awesome uh, alternative uh, truth researchers, you want to call it, conspiracy analysts, you want to call it, whatever you want to call it. Uh, some of them have become good friends as well over the over the last couple of years. No topic is taboo. We've just discussed a lot of the nefarious agendas out there, the war on the family unit with a, a guy that published a very powerful documentary earlier this year, uh, Simon Esler. In fact, I should introduce you to some of these people because they'd be great guests for your show. So that's the podcast. Lately, I've been trying to put more health content out, but I realize some of the people coming to my podcast from other people's shows, they probably are coming for the interviews. Technically, I've got a third podcast. I've only published one episode, but I have 20 lined up that are all about it. So it's called Detox, Gut Health, Weight Loss, Nutrition, and performance. I think that's exactly what it's called. Those five things. So that, that's where my health content is going to live eventually. And I'm going to get, uh, tell people on my other podcast, I'm going to stick in the future sometime. I'll stick to just interviews here. And if you want my health stuff, get onto that other podcast just so we keep it cleaner. But for now, it's all in Connecting Minds. I'm throwing out any things that are important to me. For example, I've been doing more episodes about the dangers of seed oils. I think we cannot give it too much attention, I believe. Spreading this information because too many people are still thinking they're not that good for you. Seed oils, these omega-6 polyunsaturated fatty acids are a literal toxin, a poison. And we have to be militant about spreading the information to get these poisons out of people's diets because a lot of people, it's you, it's your kids, it's your wife, and we're not setting up people for generational success. And one of the things I want to achieve with my work, to whatever extent I can master, is to set up the next generation for health so that their next generations are set up for generational health. And the only way to do that right now is to get the parents before they have kids or while their kids are still young or to get them to impart that knowledge to their kids. So change up their, their diet, lifestyle, and environment whilst the kids are still impressionable so the kids now learn those positive habits, because if you look at the disease statistics, look at these trends, in 50 years time, probably one in two people will be autistic. Every second person will be morbidly obese with heart disease and the healthy people will be truly a, a small mi minority. To reverse these statistics, these trends, we have to really inform, educate and help the younger people set themselves up for this generational health. There is no other way. That's beautiful and well worth investing time and creating that foundation for people at an early age. I think you have to start with the parents because so many people are now walking around with diabetes, with heart disease. They are what I would term vertically unwell because you don't need to be horizontal to be sick. You can still be functional, but you won't be optimally functional. And like you, I've set up a separate podcast, which is the other end of the spectrum called The Ebbing, which really is about aging because of the and loneliness and the health aspects of aging. Because when life tides recede, it reshapes our landscapes. And when we start to unveil mindfulness practices and wisdom and a graceful preparation for life's ultimate transition. So I like to meld ancient knowledge with modern insights, which can guide us to embrace change and find beauty in letting go. I think that the ebb of time becomes a spiritual voyage for those when they journey into the profound tapestry of aging. I want to bring out the prejudices about aging in, in the UK. So I think you're doing one end of the spectrum. You're doing the cradle. I'm doing towards the grave. But, but you know what? I also love that a lot of what I started with in the health space 
is again going back to my health choices in my 20s. So I started really digging into the longevity and the quote unquote anti aging. I don't think there's an anti aging recipe or formula, but there's definitely what I prefer to use is the term healthy aging and longevity. So I've definitely done a lot of research and a lot of people are like, how can you take so many supplements? What's wrong with you? Even my wife sometimes I have to remind her, we're not taking these supplements because I think we're deficient. We eat liver every second day. We eat egg yolks, organic food, really the best food I can afford, I'm getting, right? No cut. But I still take supplements and people are like, that's you're crazy. You eat so well and you're still taking supplements. You're surely not deficient in anything. I don't want to be sufficient. Okay, I, of course, I don't want to be deficient overtly. I don't want to have subclinical deficiencies of anything. But I don't just want to be sufficient. I want to be optimal when it comes to minerals, yeah. vitamins. And this is the key to healthy aging and longevity. Why are some old folks like 100 years old, you can still ride a bike, works the garden, smoke cigarettes maybe, or drinks wine? Why is that guy different from my granddad that he spent the last year of his life mostly bedridden and couldn't get up on his own? What's the difference? The difference is very small. It's little dietary things, little habits around movement, about using the body. And you can add some slightly more advanced things now with what we know. So ensuring gut function, doing your yearly or twice yearly gut cleanse just to make sure no pathogenic bacteria are taking hold because you might not feel it when they've only taken hold, but if you're immunocompromised for whatever reason, that's when they can actually really create dysbiosis. So doing that, the liver flushes that I talk about once, twice a year, it takes it, it preparation almost effortless and the, the cleanse itself takes half a day. So these things, taking extra minerals, taking extra B vitamins, be that from a supplement, egg yolks, liver, but making sure you're providing all of those essential vitamins, nutrients, minerals that are required to run your metabolic machinery. I have some clients in their 60s and I love working with these folks as well because I know that 6 to 12 months with me, I can teach you everything you need to know to get as close to the optimal that your age currently will allow. Of course, we're always fighting against the aging process, entropy or whatever you want to call it. But that doesn't mean we cannot reach what is our optimum. There's a fine spectrum there that is our optimal. I believe we can all achieve it at any age. Unless there's a very serious pathology, then it's more important to work on health restoration. But once you get to a certain level of health restoration, then we can start thinking about optimization. I don't believe mo many people are there yet, but to say, yes, I love what you're doing. And I believe we need to definitely take care of the older folks. But the way we do that is to teach the younger generation to do that because then they become old and they know how to take care of themselves. The kids, they will grow old, but they know how to take care of themselves. And they will teach their kids that are now young, but will grow old. So again, you, you teach one generation across the board and that basically solves the problem forevermore as long as they, they, they keep passing down the knowledge. And I think this is the missing piece. You are correcting what the last generation couldn't get to at that time because the information wasn't there. Yep. But now the information is here. There's a science behind it. We can actually start implementing that. And even if it does take a generation, the cathedral in Cologne, I don't know how long it took, but the initial people who were building it didn't see its completion because it took yeah. so long to build, but you have to make a start somewhere. And I think I'd love to have you on the, the Ebbing podcast to talk about that side of things. One of the things I am covering is prejudice, but there is the whole thing of diet, of nutrition, because I think that plays a significant role in our overall well-being and our mental well-being. And if a parent is listening to this, how would they optimize their child's nutrition to support their health and development? We first have to take the real massive offenders out of the diet, which unfortunately there's too many of them. And the biggest one, I have to keep sh shouting this from the rooftop. I know, I know there's a lot of guys doing great work in the area, but we just have to keep shouting it off the rooftop. So the seed oils, they are in absolutely everything at this point, everything processed pretty much. 
Give me an example for people who don't know what yeah. seed oils are. Anything that has soybean oil, so in the States, it'll be more soybean, corn oil. In Europe, it's usually sunflower oil or canola. In the States, it's also known as rapeseed oil in Europe and the UK and Ireland. So anything that has canola, these oils that I just mentioned, safflower is another one. So these seed oils are extremely inflammatory, toxic to our metabolic machinery. And literally, if we're talking about parents, this is the first thing we have to take a survey of your seed oil consumption. And I can guarantee if you're eating in restaurants, if you're ordering takeout, or if you're buying chips like packets of crisps, stuff like that, those are riddled with omega-6 polyunsaturated fatty acids, these seed oils. That also includes things like salad bars. If you go to a salad bar and buy salad uh, by the kilo, uh, a lot of these salads are just d d doused or drizzled with uh, these oils. So that's the number one thing that we have to get out of the diet any way we can. And that includes cooking more meals at home, learning to cook, to be more creative with less ingredients. So I'll, I'll give you an example. So here, pretty stuck for organic food. There's a couple of organic stores and the bigger stores have some organic products. So there's very limited range and we're very much constrained by seasons when it comes to the food we eat because we try to eat all organic. Blueberries, it's a few months. Strawberries, it's a couple of months. Watermelon, a bit of the summer. Start of the summer, we might get a month of cherries. I can get most of these things non-organic from other conventional agriculture area in the supermarkets, but I choose not to because I know too much about the pesticides, herbicides, and other chemicals used in their production. So we, we're forced to eat more seasonally. There's an orange shortage at the moment. So I considered buying some oranges that were non-organic. I looked where they're from. I'm in Portugal. These oranges were from South Africa. And they looked perfect. And the organic oranges I buy, it looks like an elephant pooped them out. They look so <laughs> bad. <laughs> but they're delicious. We have to really start educating people because a lot of organic food still has seed oils. Even if you buy organic, make sure there's no seed oils in the stuff. So we have to teach people about the value of organic food. It's not perfect. There's always risk of contamination. But if you don't buy organic, you're pretty much guaranteeing whatever you're buying has poison in it. Literal poison, pesticides, herbicides, literal poison designed to kill life. Be that plant life or bugs or whatever other pests those chemicals were designed to kill. So if you don't spend and invest that extra cash on organic food, you are literally ingesting poison every time you eat. I'm, I hate to put it in those sort of dark terms, but unfortunately, this is how dire the situation has become. I think everybody in, instinctively or, or definitely knows we live in the most polluted society that it's ever been. So we're not only fighting that the fact that the food supply is contaminated, but we are getting a lot of toxins from plastics, from air pollution as well. So unless we start to clean up the things that we directly consume as a first thing, then the home environment and the water supply and make sure we filter our shower water for 50 pounds. You can get a shower filter or $50. So unless we do these basic things, we just cannot expect to have optimal or even decent health for life. It's not going to happen. There's way too many things working against us. We have to take this really seriously. A hundred years ago, everything was fine. You could coast through life not caring about a vitamin, a mineral, whatever. You probably would have been fine. In this day and age, you have to really understand the source of your food, where it comes from. For example, what did those animals eat? Because if you're eating, let's say, an animal that was fed corn or GMO soy, you're now eating a lot of omega-6s, right? So again, you're getting these inflammatory oils or fatty acids into your body. So you have to start learning. You have to start learning more about health, diet, nutrition, detoxification, cleaning up. You have to take responsibility for your family's health, your children's health. Nobody will do the work for you. And the more you front load that work and, and taking that responsibility, the, the quicker you're going to get it down pat, the quicker it will become habit and the less stressful it will be. And the sooner you can get back to your normal life and living as you wanted to uh, initially, but now with a much better infrastructure around you that will allow you to either continue thriving or get back to thriving or stay in good health 
for longer and your kids having a better health for life. That's where I would, I would start. That's well said because we are slowly being poisoned. And un until we take our power back, and I don't mean that in a ridiculous way, I mean that from the standpoint of being able to have the knowledge and the understanding of what the hell are these things in our food and what are they doing to our biological machinery? And how is that affecting our neurology and the way that we think and how we think, whether it's the food industrial complex or that kind of machinery, it's so indelibly etched into our society that many people accept it. I lived in the States. I don't walk anywhere. And I get sick when I eat the food there. There's stores called Whole Foods there, which yeah, yeah, we yeah. have here. Yeah. I go there. And yes, it's more expensive, but I know there's no GMO, there's no soya, there's no canola. At home here, we get things from the local farm nice. and it's all organic farming. But yeah, do my carrots come nicely clean in a plastic bag? No, they come with the roots and the mud on them. Yeah. Because they've just been plucked out of the earth and put in a box. Yeah. Because it's, the soil, the terroir, is cultivated such that there, there aren't all those chemicals. Is it expensive? Yes, I wish it wasn't. And it goes bad faster. It goes bad, yeah. It goes you can't keep, faster. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the fridge yeah. life of it. Yeah. And I've noticed that. Even the fruits that we get, you have to eat them within a few days. And I think for many people, number one, it's the expense. Number two, it's the inconvenience of it. But it's not that, it's the infrastructure that facilitates that environment. Yeah. And the underlying motive, unfortunately, is profit-taking. That's the underlying motive. Is it about health care? No, it's about no. sick care. People have to understand as well that a lot of these pesticides, herbicides, they're originated from the chemical weapon industry, the weapons of war research. Wow, so, I didn't know that. Yeah, uh, was it 2,4-D? They were using it to defoliate the jungles in Vietnam. I, I forget which chemical it was. Okay, if you take a, an orange, let's say, or, or a piece of fruit or vegetable, it has very small amounts of these pesticides, right? But if you look at what acute toxicity, let's say someone in the agriculture industry has an acute exposure, if you look at the symptoms of acute toxicity, they're generally very nasty. Ataxia, paralysis, convulsions, just really horrible things. If something in high doses is very dangerous, why do people think that a little bit here and there on your food every day, three times a day should be acceptable? I don't think it's acceptable. I don't think it's a good thing that I'm paying, let's say, 30 euro for a kilogram of meat, organic meat, but I pay it. Because I know I can get the same similar cut of meat for maybe six, seven euro. Yeah. But I'm paying this money because I've done the research. I've done my homework. And once the stuff I know, you will never go. Okay. I, I would admit once in a while, I crave really nice tomatoes. There's a place here that I get the non-organic, but that's three times a year. And I know I'm taking a hit, but I just never buy things that I know are not organic certified. I just don't do it. Imagine you're allergic to that one. Whatever that food is, you just cross it. Every time you look at it, yeah, it looks tasty, but oh, I'm allergic. So you just pretend you're allergic to it or it will kill you. <laughs> whatever helps you to dissociate from the, the foods that you used to like, let's say Doritos or whatever. Hopefully nobody's eating Doritos anymore. We know it's straight up the worst of the worst, but we have to make certain hard decisions and the dividends are they're not even going to pay off today or tomorrow. The hardest part is psychological factories. You're paying more money. You're not receiving a benefit. You might not even, in 20 years time, you might not even see a tangible benefit. But the other option is, let's say, decide oh, I'm not going to spend all this money on organic food. I'm going to save up for a holiday and I'm going to go on a holiday, two holidays a year instead of that money being for the organic food. In 20, 30 years time, Let's say you could clone yourself in another timeline. I can almost guarantee that clone that went the conventional way instead of the organic way is going to have a lot more health problems. Unfortunately, we cannot look into the future. And this is why the incentives are a little bit messed up right now. We are currently being incentivized to buy the cheap garbage that has poison in it. And we're disincentivized to buy the healthy food that's been meticulously prepared by, by people that care about this kind of stuff, right? The, the one farm we get our beef from, 
they never separate the mama cow and the calf. They never separate them. And we know what the, the mass-produced meat is, especially in the USA and stuff, all these confined feedlot operations, eating foods that they're not meant to eat, getting injected, never seeing the, the light of day and stuff like that. Not only are we supporting our health, but we're supporting a better ecology by investing into the companies that are doing this ge- regenerative uh, uh, agriculture and all that other good stuff. It's for your own benefit if you eat organic, but if you actually start looking into it, by supporting the companies doing organic, you're actually supporting the direction that we want to take the world, regenerating the ecology, uh, regenerating people's health, living more in tune with Mother Nature and all that good stuff. There's a lot of benefits other than just health to eating organic, even though it's a little bit of an extra investment for people. Yeah, yeah supporting a movement as distinct from the poisonous microdosing that has a cumulative effect in your physiology and it wreaks complete havoc with your hormonal system, mm-hmm. with your neurology, with your blood work, all of that. Yeah. And again, I, I'm back to the story of diabetes as you take responsibility. And that means, yeah, you've got to do the research. And I know some people don't care. And that's fine. If they want to be slumped in comfort and fed like a dog, then that's up to them. If you're someone that wants to optimize your health, optimize your performance, I know when I go to Greece and I see people in community there and I see people of 80 and 90 working, carrying, moving, yes, some of them smoke and they have their wine, they have restorative sleep, they have a great sense of community, which I know because I've seen it creates a sense of immunity because it's not just physiological immunity, it's mental immunity, it's emotional immunity. There is this beautiful common unity, if you will, Mm -hmm. right, between people. And there is a support. If someone doesn't have enough food, then in Greece we say it's philotimor, which means you help that person. If a person's hungry, you feed them. And all the foods I've ever had where I go on the island is all fresh food. The fish that you get, you see the fishermen bringing the fish on the boat, walking across the street with a big bucket of fish to the fish market. Yeah. Okay. You could say what's in the water and what's on the seabed. And yeah, there is all of that, but they haven't injected it or put preservatives in it. So like salmon, they want to make it look pink when salmon is really gray Mm. and all these kinds of things. The horatiki, the Greek salad, it's all fresh. And and you know what? You can see the contrast, like tomatoes and avocados there are vibrant, large. The colors are stunning. I come to England, you go to a supermarket. Plastic. I can't, plastic. I can't get a ripe avocado. And when you eat that food, you feel your ingesting vitality Mm -hmm. and you feel really good. There's no bloating. Even when I go to the Fornos or the bakery, you buy this fresh bread, like sourdough bread, Mm. and they cultivate the sourdough, like a mother sourdough, and they take parts from it, and then they bake all kinds of breads from it. You're making me hungry, bro. (laughs) It goes back to what we're talking about is the way that our society is set up, and this is why you're doing what you're doing. Now, look, I know time's against us, and there's so much I haven't spoken to you about. I would love to dive into more of that and also dive more into autism in your book, because there's a lot of things I haven't asked you about parent-child communication and your future perspectives and things that parents can do and sleep optimization and detoxification. We can cover so many things. Even for, for your adult listeners, we can talk about not just protecting. A lot of people understand we have to protect ourselves from the toxins but we're still getting daily minute exposures that cu- accumulate. Teaching people how to do basic things around supporting their detoxification system, little cleanses we can talk about, gut health, improving the brain, that. Performance, mind my, um, function, mind performance, all of these things. I could chew your ear off on all these topics. That would be great. If you want to do a series with me, I would love to do that. I'd love to bring more of the psychology to it. Now, if we've got a plan... We can do a series and see how that goes. Sure. Because I do think there is a well-being crisis. 
And we need to tackle that well-being crisis by getting this information out to people and giving them practical toolkits of understanding, not a rule book of behavior, but things that they can apply or humanize into application in their everyday life. Love it. Absolutely love it. And Thank you. I'd love to get your message out there. We haven't really covered much of your book. This is what my mind is saying to me, saying, here's a man who's got amazing knowledge, a lot of practical tools, can really help a lot of people and to debunk some of the myths that currently people maybe have an inkling about, but prefer to put their head in the sand. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, let's get some home truths out there because you've got the science, you've got the background, I've got a lot of psychology and that aspect to it. If you want, we could record here and then I could also post it on my show. We exactly. Could do it the cross post. Yeah, that's the whole idea. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, let's do that. And so I'll we, post it on the website as well. It's just come to mind, but I thought if we get a table of contents out for each episode, if you can think about what you want to cover in each episode. Yeah. And we can put it together and we can promote it and get recording. Right off the bat, in no particular order, we can talk about improving brain health and mental performance. Okay. We can talk all about gut health one whole episode. We could talk about supporting detoxification and stress reduction. Oh, yeah, stress reduction. I'm sure you, you have a lot of stuff we could talk about there. Sleep optimization. All the good ones optimization empowering parents we could do empowering parents nutrition and diet supplementation yeah yeah, yeah. All, all that stuff also she's been sick like three four times obviously so i've learned a thing or two how to support her that you can do it naturalistically etc cetera, etc cetera. why don't we do an initial one where we lay the foundation by understanding the basics so we have a list of the basics that you need to understand if you want to optimize your health and your well-being and your performance in life. Okay. I like it. Because then at least we're leading people on a journey. Yeah. We're leading listeners on a journey of, okay, here are the basics that you need to understand. So we know that diet plays a significant role. We know that supplementation plays a significant role. Detoxification, stress, sleep optimization. We could also do a... A whole episode, episode just on supplementation. There's actually a lot to, to unpack there. Yeah. And how can somebody track, trace, and evaluate their progress when they're implementing health strategies? Or what are some practical ways parents can measure and children can measure and assess the impact of the changes they're making in their routine? Can we have specific markers or metrics that they need to pay attention to when they're monitoring their progress? Yeah. And things like balancing individual needs, because every child is unique, every human being is unique. There's a balance between following general health recommendations and then tailoring them to their child's specific requirements. Mm -hmm. And look at sustainability. The, the Japanese call it the 100-year prescription, which involves long-term well-being, right? It's a long-term journey. Because how can someone stay motivated and committed to maintaining that lifestyle over time? It needs to have sustainability. Absolutely. One other idea that came into my head as well was we could even talk about, quote unquote, not weight loss per se, but fat loss or body recomposition. I think a lot of people are doing it wrong and they're hurting themselves for the long term. So that's another topic we could talk about if you want. This is something I was putting together and what I call it is weight release. Weight. Okay. I like that. <laughs> right. I don't call it weight loss because the brain doesn't like to lose anything. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And the recidivism rate is 95%. Yeah, yeah. But it's a billion dollar industry. Ah, I wonder why that is. Mm -hmm. So to guide people through a, through a holistic journey of weight release. So you learn about nutrition, exercise, mindset, brain chemistry and sustainable lifestyle changes. This is like a, a sacred odyssey to body and soul liberation. Wow. That is right. a lot more beautiful than, than the way I frame it, but okay, <laughs> I like it. That's how I'm framing it because like it, it. it's a program I have. It's called the Matrix of Transformation. 
And the matrix of transformation is about this sacred odyssey to body and soul liberation. So it's not only achieving your physical health goals, but also a deep connection with your inner self. It's a holistic approach that combines spiritual wisdom with all the science and the practical tools to support you on your path to wellness. That sounds incredible. So that's what I've been working on for some time now. And a lot of it is to do with emotional liberation. And I don't really like to use the word spiritual because spiritual is of spirit, but more one's own universal growth, one's own evolution. And even if you look at the first four letters of that, it's love backwards. Interesting. Then we create a supportive community where we can offer encouragement and accountability and a sense of belonging as a side benefit of the podcast, invite people onto a Zoom meeting like this where they have a group coaching program. I like it. I like it. So not only do they get all the accountability, they get community. They leave with a toolkit of practices and strategies that they can continue to use for ongoing growth and well-being. So they may meet as strangers, but hopefully with community, they'll leave like family and make those connections with each other. Because then we yes, can have a bigger yes, impact. Yes, see? to all of those things you just said, bro. Yeah. You've we can have a bigger impact. Stuff. I like that. I like that. And I love doing the podcast and I'll continue to keep doing them. But I want to have a bigger impact as well. So doing a series will enable us to reach a wider audience. I think what, what I've, I decided over the last couple of weeks, that's why I've been recording. I, I was doing the audio only episodes with me talking about health issues. But I, the last couple of ones, I did them with the video because of what I want to do is once it's published on the podcast, usually it gets lost over time. So I want to start having an area of my website. You click a drop down and you can learn about a specific topic. So any of these that we record together, I can put them under, a spe let's say, weight loss or stress reduction. I can have resources. So if someone is interested in that, click on the website, click the menu, click what topic they're interested in, and then they'll see a number of different resources. That's the plan I'm having. Beautiful. I love that. We can be a part of the solution if we want to be. Um, Peter, but, this was a pleasure, brother. Thank you. That's it for today's episode of Transcendent Minds. We hope you enjoyed this exploration of the mysteries of the mind and of the human experience. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions for future episodes, we would love to hear from you. Be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts. And if you feel inclined, please leave a rating and a review as this goes a long way, and follow us on social media to stay up to date with the latest episodes. Thanks for tuning in, and until next time, keep transcending your mind.